Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Jeff Pugh. I'm the director of the graduate uh, programs in conflict resolution here at UMass Boston. I'm a professor in the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance. Um, we're joined by uh, a couple of the folks from our department. I should say we are kind of dividing our efforts tonight because we have another big event going on, on at the State House at the same time as this. Uh, but Karen Ross is here, uh, one of my colleagues in the department, and Billy Ward Mason in the back, who is uh, our, one of our program coordinators. Uh, and we're honored to have tonight two speakers uh, who are both close to my heart. I've been, uh, I started a year and a half ago, and since I got here, I wanted to bring them here. Erica, um, Bridgeport here is the uh, director of training at Community Mediation Maryland, and she was the one who trained me as a mediator a number of years ago when I was at Johns Hopkins. Um, Laura Charcodian is the executive director of Community Mediation Maryland. So um, the two and and the founder of many programs in in Maryland. Um, so the two of them are going to talk about some of the work that they've done in the community mediation movement, and in Erica's case, even beyond that, as an activist um, in Baltimore. So um, Lorig is, as I said, the executive director. She's worked with state partnerships, state agencies in Maryland um, to bring collaborative conflict resolution to new and unique forms. She's been a trainer. She's provided technical assistance to 18 community mediation programs in Maryland and has really innovated a, a model called reentry mediation, uh, which is in prisons, helping people to um, build a plan about what's going to happen when they get released. Erica is the director of training for Community Mediation Maryland, uh, so she's the one doing the trainings with these 18 community mediation centers. Um, and then she's also overseeing the performance-based evaluation process that they have in Maryland. Uh, she's been involved in community activism since the late 90s, um, after the murder of her brother David in 2007, served as a catalyst for uh, her new passion to, to really end uh, violence it, through legislative activism. Um, she was involved in the effort to repeal the death penalty, the successful effort to repeal the death penalty in Maryland. Um, and to inspire a law that provides needed resources for homicide survivors. And you can see from her t-shirt, she's been involved in um, the, the 300 Men March movement, which helps to reduce the homicide rate in Baltimore's most violent neighborhoods. So you'll hear more um, from her about that. Um, I just want to give one last mention um, that in this field we see a lot of inspiring examples and practitioners. Um, I always like to see people um, kind of uh, show their personal commitment to their work, and, and Laura is doing that this coming weekend. Uh, there are lots of ways that we can uh, serve people, but the reentry mediation program that she spearheaded has discovered one of the challenges that is that families that are going to mediate with people in, in prisons often are um, have economic challenges, have a hard time just being transported to the place of the mediation. And that takes money. It takes some funds to be able to uh, provide transportation for those families so that that's not a barrier to mediation. So Lori decided to take a personal challenge and she, uh, this coming weekend, will be running from where, from where to where? So about 70 miles. Um, she's going to be running in order to raise awareness, visibility, and funds to help uh, to provide funds for these families uh, doing prison-based mediation. Did you so, say this was the second year in the world that she Yes, she did that already last year, and she just loved it so much she came back for more. <laughs> Uh, so an, an inspiring example, and, and feel free to look that effort up. I think it's on their web page um, if you're interested in, in finding out more. So please join me in welcoming our, our guests here tonight, and I look forward to, um, to hearing what they have to say and then having some dialogue after.
before you get too excited, it's it's 70 miles over the course of two days. Like if I was a real badass, I'd do it in one day, and it takes me two. So. I know you're probably disappointed now. Let's stick around. Anyways. So uh, what we're going to talk about is the community mediation movement as we uh, are involved in it in Maryland, and what it means for us. Uh, and some of what it has evolved into, including the reentry mediation program, which I'm going to talk about most, mostly about. Um, but just so I get a sense of who's here, how many people are uh, mediators themselves? So I feel like actively mediate. Okay, uh, community mediation folks. Yay. Okay, students studying conflict resolution. People who came for the food. <laughs> uh, Patriots fans. She's a Ravens fan. I my scotch I told him I was like, wow, <laughs> Alright, so, um, I'm actually, I grew up in Newton, so I uh, haven't lived here since I was 18, but, um, well, that doesn't stop from the rest of the doesn't stop from, yeah. So, um, alright, so in, in Maryland, what we, uh, the way that we think about the community mediation movement is as a movement, right, so we believe that it is a social change, grassroots social change movement. Um, there are, the term community mediation actually gets used in a lot of different settings around the country. Um, learning about Massachusetts where there's sort of elements of grassroots social change in the movement and it sounds like we may be able to do more in our conversations with folks over the next couple days to support that piece uh, of it to, uh, to sort of uh, be more to, to what it's about. Um, there's two pieces though that we want to highlight in our conversation today. One piece of it is um, and one piece that, that supports it to be a grassroots social change movement is that what, how we do things are as important as what we do. So the thing that we offer, mediation, um, is valuable and it's a, it's, a, it's a process that we know can uh, you know, transform relationships and can uh, save lives and can save money. Um, and can, repeat, uh, can decrease repeat use of tort systems and, and other uh, social service agencies. And the way that we offer it, and by that I mean who the mediators are and where they come from, where the mediations happen, how early or late in the process the mediations happen, who the partners are that are engaged <laughs> with the community mediation center, when the mediation is happening. All of those things, how we do what we do, uh, is as important, and that's the piece that has the potential to actually transform communities. And so that, that piece about what we do is as important, how we do it is as important as what we do, um, is, a real, is a real core piece that Erica's gonna talk more about in just a second. Uh, the second thing that I wanna highlight is this piece about relationships matter. So this is our, our tagline, if you go to our website, one of the things that we hashtag on all of our postings is this piece about relationships matter. And what's cool about it is that if you look at research that has nothing to do with conflict resolution research, that has nothing to do with, with mediation, um, if you look at recidivism research, which we're going to talk about in a minute, you look at addiction recovery research, you look at heart disease recovery research, you look at diabetes research, you look at uh, uh, student truancy research, right? look at all of these sort of social challenges that we have. And in all of them, there's a bunch of stuff that matters, right? So jobs and, and addiction recovery services matter, and diabetes medication matters, and access to healthcare. But in all of them, relationships also matter, right? Like people having strong, supportive relationships matter. And folks who have burned bridges because of the challenges in their lives, and folks who have lost relationships or never known how to engage with people in deep relationships, struggle more with all of those other uh, challenges than people who have strong relationships to support them through it. And so what we've seen in that then, in the context of the movement in Maryland, is that there's this opportunity to bring this amazing process of mediation into these social challenges and to address this one of many pieces, certainly, but to address the relationship component of those social challenges. And so it's a new way of conceiving of what it is that we can do with mediation. And really, we got to that point. We got to thinking about how do we bring mediation into these social challenges because our mediators come from all walks of life and come from the diversities of our community. And so they are engaged with us, talking about their lives and their challenges and everything that's going on in their lives. And as we engage in those conversations, we go, oh wow, so people getting out of prison, that's a challenge. We do mediation, maybe we can make that connection. 
So I'm going to talk more about the prison reentry piece of it in just a second, um, as it ties to that relationships matter. But before I move on to that, I'm going to uh, you're gonna do your piece yeah. and then we'll move. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, so this thing Lord is saying about how we do what we do is important. Um, and that is my whole entire story about how I got involved in this work. So in two, I'm going to give you the highlights of the story. So in 2001, um, well, before that, I had three, I had three brothers. I'm the only girl and I'm the oldest. I grew up in West Baltimore. Um, and in 2001, one of my brothers, we call him Pop, was shot by one of our friends. So this was a friend who was so close to our family that it was as if one of our cousins had shot him. It was like a very, you know, painful situation. And it literally was over some conflict they were having and they happened to be playing dice or cards or something one day in the neighborhood. My brother got smart with this guy. The guy went in the house, a few doors down the street from our house, came back out with a gun in broad daylight, chased my brother around the corner and shot him. My brother was dead on arrival. And at the time, I was working at a place called Baltimore City Healthy Start where I was providing case management for pregnant um, women and their children up to age two, mostly low income and, and teen moms. And so um, during this time while he was at the hospital, we were waiting for him to wake up, basically. And so I sent in all my paperwork and everything to use my vacation time and my sick days, and you know, and I would do all of my work, and then I was leaving half the day to go see my brother. At first, my supervisor was really compassionate and understanding, and then about day three in this process, um, she started making little snide remarks which, you know, I wasn't a mediator yet, so I was made a snide remarks back. <laughs> and she was threatening to write me up for being insubordinate, and I was threatening to call Channel 13. And, you know, like it was, and then people on our team were taking sides, and you know, everybody was on my side because I was right. And, uh, and so she happened to know, because Baltimore City Healthy Star had a partnership with the local community mediation center to provide space to do mediation, so what happens is the Mediation Center partners with organizations, agencies, places all over the city to say, hey, do you have space where people who live in this community can have mediations for free so that the conflicts are being resolved in the neighborhoods in which the conflicts are happening. And so there was a partnership already built. So my supervisor happened to know about this organization who provides me free mediation services but also conflict management training. So as an olive branch, she offered to, um, you know, say, hey, our staff needs conflict management training, right? So here comes Lori doing this, you know, but I think it was like a one hour presentation. And I was really mad to be there because I was like, this is some crap. She's just trying to get me to learn how to do it. Sounds like what you're saying is just so she can be mean to me. You know, it worked, right? And so at the end of this presentation, Lori said, hey, you should be a mediator. And I was like, that's nice. How much does it pay? Um, not realizing, you know, it was volunteer work and that I was going to love it. Um, so anyway, I ended up getting into the training. I became a mediator. I quickly started mediating. Um, and I got a job at the mediation center. Um, and then, you know, got promoted from there. But then also, a few years later, um, my, my my mom started working there very soon after as well. She went through mediation training. She was a very active mediator, and so she ended up being the person to do intake there um, around 2002 or three. 2007, so Pop survived, right? To, yay, right? <laughs> 2007, I'm, I'm now a trainer. I'm doing a basic mediation training with a partnership we had at the Office of Public Defenders. And I get a phone call basically that my brother Corny, that's David that Jeff mentioned, had been killed. And so um, that was very impactful in our lives. Um, and it was, so a lot of things. It was the people all around the state of Maryland who are community mediation folks who came together and helped to pay for my brother's funeral, surround us in love, all of that stuff. Um, 
And then later, you know, Lord is also building this reentry mediation program. Now, my brother had been in and out of prison throughout his life. So my mom, who was now for years now, the intake person, was saying, I'm not being involved in reentry mediation at all. I'm not going into the prison. I'm not doing intakes on the calls because it triggered all of her pain and trauma around my brother being murdered. And these were a lot of the jails and prisons that we used to visit him in. So she just said she could not do it. Um, and then we have our AmeriCorps program where we place AmeriCorps members all around the state in these community mediation centers. My brother Pop, who had gotten shot the first time, became an AmeriCorps member and started doing the reentry intake work at the community mediation center. So he's now going in to Price. So he was a victim, he had been an offender in his life. Now he was going into the prison doing this outreach work to other incarcerated people. Um, and um, laying a lot of the groundwork for a lot of the, the statistics that you're going to see today. And then some years passed, and just being involved in the work, there came this funding, because you know Lloyd kept banging her head up against brick walls until they cracked. And then they, <laughs> they, brick walls, yeah, not her head, right? And um, she, and so there was funding now available to have um, a re-entry like person in charge of the reentry project in both Baltimore and Hagerstown. And my mother went from, I can't take it, I don't want to see it, I don't want to have anything to do with it, to now she is the person running that project. All because this was the work that was changing our lives as a family, literally. And so, um, so if, if we had, if the community mediation center had not been partnering with community organizations, had not been trying to do the work of getting, seeing incarcerated people as a part of our community. A lot of the work that my family has actually done that has helped us in our healing process to be able to take all the pain and trauma of violence that has impacted our life, to be able to do something meaningful with it. Um, I don't know what we would be doing right now. So that's part of the story. Um, yeah. so, uh, I put up the 10 points. Erica's family introduction kind of covers um, most of the a lot of them. But one of the things that I'll just take a second to highlight, because I think there's a lot of lip service to diversity in a lot of settings. And for us, when we talk about diversity, it's not just about having to uh, be able to count racial and ethnic groups in the room. Um, but this piece about we've had to fight really hard at the, um, both with, uh, with the for our public safety, with the Maryland judiciary, with our funders from the Corporate and National Community Service, to be able to have people who don't have high school diplomas serve as mediators, to be able to have people who have criminal backgrounds serve as mediators and participate. So when we talk about diversity, and, and you heard some of that in Erica's story, um, you know, a lot, it, it is really about who is everybody in our community, what are all of them, are offering the service, are the ones who are part of, of who, it's us, who <coughs> is part of us and we're part of the community, right? So, um, so, so I just, that's, by the way, the mediation if you want to find us. I don't think that's on your handout, but that's where you can find out more about the, the movement in general. I want to flip to talking about reentry mediation because it really, it came about uh, from a, a couple of different, uh, and this website is on your handout, so you can come back to it. There's a bunch of stuff on there. I'll show you some of it. I'm going to show you a video in just a second. But with, um, so... So what, the way that this sort of, the way this got built is that we were doing mediations in the community from the various partnerships that we had. We were finding that a lot of folks who had recently been released from prison were in our mediations, and part of what they were talking about in the mediation, and it might have been a family conflict or a neighbor conflict or like whatever you might have in the community, and part of what folks were talking about was the impact of 10 years being locked up, right? The person who had been incarcerated is talking about that impact. The person on the outside is talking about that impact. And all of that 10 years of like, how do we deal with this history is playing out in this conflict about, and you never get home on time, and you never bring the car back when you said you're gonna bring the car back, and you're, never, you're not doing your share of the stuff around. Like, so we're, we're talking about stuff that everyone is fighting about, and then there's this extra impact of what incarceration does to a family. And so we started thinking about this and going, okay, it's so like how do we address those things, not just once things escalate on the outside, but is there a way to look strategically at, could we be offering this? If that's a common challenge, 
Um, could we be offering this in a different way? And then because among our community members, among our mediators, we had people who had been incarcerated themselves, and we had people who had had family members incarcerated, as we started having those dialogues internally, it very quickly became clear that the way to do it was to work with folks before they got released, right? As we started hearing about, yeah, like not only is it a challenge on the outside, but as someone's getting closer to release, the person on the outside is going, holy shit, where is this head going to be this time, right? And the person on the inside is going, oh my god, I still don't know where I'm going to live. I still don't know how I'm going to make this work. I still don't know. So all that anxiety, like of course everyone's excited to get out, and there's all kinds of anxiety sort of leading towards that moment. Um, now here's what's kind of cool about it. I, I like to pretend, so in some settings I pretend that I like did all the research, the criminal justice research, and then, then I designed this like uh, best practice based on the criminal justice research. But the, in reality, we designed it based on people's experiences, and then it turned out to fit really nicely. Because then when I went back to go like, how are we gonna get money for this? Let me see what the criminal justice research says. <laughs> There's two really important things that it says. And one is relationships matter, right? Not a shock to those of us who do this work. Um, so relationships matter people, and it, you know, even when they isolate, like they look at all the various things that make a difference and isolate the impact of having positive relationships. So even if you have housing and jobs and education and all those other things, you don't have strong relationships, you're not going to get successful on the outside. The other thing is that the moment of release and the 48 hours after release are key in predicting where you're going to be three years from now. <coughs> so if you imagine like a course correction, right? Like you imagine if I start walking this way, right, for three years, and if I just make one slight shift that doesn't seem like that big of a deal in this moment, and I start walking this way for three years, I'm gonna end up in a very different place, right? And so when you think about recidivism and people getting locked up within the next three years, that where people are gonna end up if they make just slightly different sort of moves in those first 48 hours are gonna be really different. So now we had both personal experience and we had the research, and then we spent, and I'll, I'll spare you the details, um, two years uh, banging our heads against the wall, negotiating, engaging with the Department of Public Safety and saying, here's why we think this makes a lot of sense, and can we come in and do it? Um, and what's really important about that, I know there's people in the room who are getting ready to have these conversations here in Massachusetts, and the next two days I'm gonna be doing a training on how to be a re-entry mediator. Um, and so that's really exciting. Congratulations, coming Ooh. soon, hopefully, to a prison near you. Um, the, what the, the, what's really important is, one, it took two years, right? It's like being ready for this to be a really significant, long conversation. Now, this was in 2007, so like reentry is pretty hot right now. Like people are paying attention to it in ways that they weren't in 2007. So hopefully that, uh, you know, will fast forward your dialogue here in Massachusetts a little more. Um, but the other is that, um, while there's going to be some compromises, and I mean compromises, I mean like selling out on things that are important to us, um, there were certain areas that we were not willing to, to sell out on. There were certain places where we felt like there were ethical standards that had to be met. And so some of those areas where the Department of Public Safety wanted to have <coughs> correction staff in the room listening to the conversation, um, and that was a point of like a fundamental uh, ethic of, of mediation is the confidentiality. And so. Um, so we did, you know, like folks know, like interest-based negotiations, so we said, like, what is it that's important to you about having correction staff in the room? Like, what are you concerned about? And the concern is about contraband, and the concern is about safety. So we say, okay, let's talk about how you can get safety and ensure the contraband isn't coming in, and we can be sure of privacy. Like, how do we get both of those things? Right? And that kind of conversation with a bureaucracy takes a year and a half. So, conversation <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we, we worked through all that, we piloted it, we started it. What I want to, uh, and, and we, we started in a few places, um, and uh, what I want to do actually is let some of the people who have used the service themselves uh, tell you a little bit about this. I'm going to show you, so if you go to this website, which you can see what it is here, there's a ton of stuff on here. This is a, a summary of it, and this is a whole bunch of press that we've gotten over here that's worth looking at. Um, but I just want to show you this, and maybe we can like dim the lights back there. If you guys want to while people talk about their own experiences the service. This was a good opportunity for us to talk and we're having the mediators there who were pretty much just listeners and mm -hmm. helped to kind of facilitate the conversation. Um, I think it was a positive um, event for all of them. They get up a little bored and start looking at certain things and then figuring out certain problems. They didn't say too much. They just let us really like, figure it out. <laughs> right. They had a little input in there, so I really appreciated that because it was pushing and forcing them to work. April, um, also, 
comes with all these different things or like, you know, what is it that um, you guys want to talk about? Is there any conflicts? And mm -hmm. like I said, that was the biggest conflict for us. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, we went over the um, things about, you know, when he comes home and setting up the you know, details of what the woods right. really going to look like. Right. So we did all that. We did charts and all kinds of stuff like that. So it is, it, I really would advise, you know, people to get into it because it, it, it is a helper. It can be a very positive exercise if people are honest with what the expectations are because not only is the inmate that have he may have expectations, she may have expectations about her family mm -hmm. that he or she will feel comfortable enough to share that. And then on the other hand, for the family members to feel comfortable enough. Well, I can't go, I knew exactly what I needed to do. The support I did have, what I didn't have, okay. so it just really like outlined everything that, that, that I was available to when I came in. I've been on five months now, and it's like, I'm doing good.
So back even when we had no money, um, what we set up, we started working on setting up a data collection process that would allow us to, oops, that's not what we wanted to have happen, is it? Um, All right, well, I'll just tell you about it. It's on your web. You can click on it later. Um, I'm not sure why that's doing it, but um, I think it's on here. I wanted to show you the so recidivism piece. So we did a, um, do, do you want to try to do something with it? I can try. Okay, that's all right. I can talk about it. Um, so, uh, so we did a um, recidivism analysis, and we compared folks who went through mediation to folks, uh, to a couple of different control groups. And uh, collected enough data about people. Yeah, I'm gonna get there in a second. We're not there yet. I'm not alive in prison. Yet. Um, <laughs> collect enough, collect enough um, data about um, about folks so that we can, and if people are researchers, so we can hold constant for all the other factors that might be affecting recidivism. And what we found was, or what the researcher found was that just one two-hour mediation session decreases the predicted probability of reincarceration by 10%. And each additional session decreases it by another 7%. Which, if you think about like how complex uh, recidivism is, uh, that issue, and, and how you know much we're trying to figure out how do we change the prison system to really decrease recidivism, having a one two-hour session have that much of an impact, and then another two-hour session that much of an impact is really pretty remarkable, and so it kind of comes back to this question about um, the the um, the uh, the impact that relationships have. So that that research is um, uh, on here, uh, if you, and then it's this website that you can come to and find later if you want to read either the one-page summary of it or. If you really geeky, the 60-page version <laughs> that includes the logistical regression analysis and the Cox hazard analysis and the survival function and all of those kinds of things. It's pretty exciting. So yeah, it sounds like it does. It does. Um, so that's there. Um, and uh, and so then I do want to say, if you are trying to make this work now, you're welcome because you know the, the hope is that like having this work in another state and then having recidivism data like that opens up the conversations in the next place so that those are easier conversations to have. Um, having said that, I will say that as much as I like, have been sort of a little bit disparaging of the Department of Public Safety in Maryland um, and the amount of time it took to, to make things happen there, Maryland is still the only state in the country um, where the Department of Public Safety has allowed community mediation centers the kind of access that we have um, to do this on a regular basis with almost everybody who's being released from their system. So I have to give them a shout out for that despite other uh, disagreements that I still have with them about many other things. Um, it, you know what, I, would, I actually, let me just click on to something else if I could, because I'm gonna wrap up in a minute to Erica. So let me, these other ones are working, right? Not, is nothing working or? So if there are folks who are interested in the, the run for re that, uh, do we get out of it? Here it is. Okay. So you go to our website. Um, anything else? I'm sorry. Okay. Well, but Eric is. is Mine is just a YouTube thing. Okay. So this is even more. Okay. So, anyways, uh, if you go to. That's not going to come Okay. Never mind. So, if you go to. Um, <laughs> if you, so, if you want to find out more about the run for reentry, you can see the map and the, how to donate and all that good stuff. Um, and then on here, you'll be able to follow. Uh, you can just get on the Facebook page and follow the run. If anyone wants to come to Maryland and do a section of it, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it gets kind of boring running for 12 hours, 30 bucks. Uh, I love the company. Um, so um, the, if you go to mdmediation.org, if you can't remember that uh, website there, then you can click right over to, to this. If you want that. Um, I'm going to stop now and tag Erica and then after both of us speak, I think that we need questions and there's some conversations that we want to have with you too, so. Tag Erica. I'm at again. Okay, so um, another piece is um, for me, and I think I'm I, I feel really blessed that because of the work I do in my day job, I am very aware that all <coughs> social justice issues impact all other social justice <coughs> issues. So for me, I wanted to become a mediator and specifically a trainer so that I could be engaged in working with people who came from neighborhoods that I come, like the one I come from, um, struggle with the same kinds of socioeconomic issues and racism and, you know, class 
injustices and addiction recovery and all kinds of things like that. And so, um, so Jack talked about um, my work with the death penalty in Maryland. Actually, we got to back up a little bit because when I first started working at the Community Mediation Center, I saw Lord going to the prison. She would be pregnant and have her belly with like a big sign on it that was about not killing people at the death penalty. And this would be on the day that somebody was scheduled to be executed. And so she would be with this group of people at the prison till late night, you know, until they actually executed the person protesting. And so I was safely, you know, sitting in my office like, those crazy white people, you know, like, that's so nice that they can do that. Like, you know, if it comes to a vote, I'll vote. You know that, no, the death penalty is not really justice for anybody, you know. Um, so I I had no idea that I would uh, that I would get involved in the work. But after my brother was killed in 2007, because of the work that Lori had already been doing in her own activism um, around the death penalty, people knew to contact her to say, "Hey, we want somebody to come who can train." homicide survivors around how to tell their story, but also to go and talk to legislators about. Um, being against the death penalty, which is not an everyday thing for a homicide survivor to say, I don't think the death penalty is justice for my loved one who was murdered. And so um, Lord said, well, I don't have personal experience with that, but I can take her down the hall. And so, um, so that's how I actually got involved in death penalty work, again, because of the work I was already doing in my day job. Um, and so it really just so happened that I was able to articulate things that people um, had been saying, but I was saying it in a West Baltimore kind of way. <laughs> you know? And there were some new things I was probably saying. Um, and so I think coming from someone who had experienced losing someone to murder helped to shift people's thinking in a way that they couldn't deny what was being said and to touch hearts in a different kind of way. Um, and so I was very blessed to be able to do that work and just being able to know how to use my voice impacted legislators in a way where they said, oh, and there are these other laws we need to create so that homicide survivors are on the board that determines whether or not homicide survivors get money when their loved one is murdered, right? And so that law got created um, because the way I look at it is that law got created because my brother was murdered. And so that is, um, for me, it's constantly, like a lot of the work that I do, I was already doing social justice work. I'm involved in the peace movement with community mediation. Um, but then all just these other opportunities opened up because I wanted to do something just with the grieving process that I'm going to be enduring for the rest of my life. Um, and so connected to that, of course, be, and a part of me knowing how to use my voice is because my daily work is about working on understanding, right? Teaching people how to be compassionate, teaching people how to speak for their own needs in the way another person can hear. So it's my skills as a mediator and as a trainer that gave me a lot of the tools that I had to be able to use my voice in these in these other arenas and to help other people use things. And so was is peace work, you know. So these are men who decided that a lot because a lot of the murder that's happening in Baltimore is perpetrated perpetrated by men and men are the victims of it. Um, that there should be men more in the streets saying something about it. So historically women generally get it. You know, we're the heads of the nonprofits, we're running 70 miles, you know, like we're doing all of the work to be like, there should be justice, you know. Um, and men aren't as around as you can even look in this room and see, right? And so it's a it's something that you notice across social justice movements. And so um, so this group of men just said, we need to be doing something about violence in Baltimore and letting women know that men are present, that they are not by themselves. And so it started with a march on North Avenue just as a symbolic thing. Um, but it was important about that is North Avenue goes from the east side to the west side of Baltimore. And so they walked it and then walked it back again. Um, and so that first year, me and my whole family came to the march to find out that only men were allowed to march that day. And so my daughters and, and, myself, and myself, we did a lot of other stuff that day to help you know, support and encourage the men on the 10 mile walk. And my son, who 
was 15 at the time, walked alone. And it changed him. He became one of the first teen captains of the movement. Then I told my brother Pop about it, right, who had gotten shot the first time, and that's how I got involved in community mediation. He's now one of the biggest miles and captains of the 300 Men March movement. Um, and the movement is not really just about marching. It is a grassroots volunteer effort, just like community um, mediation is. And so um, it is people going out into communities, engaging other people. It is people, we just bought four abandoned houses in East Baltimore to turn into a community center. Um, and um, there's a leadership program for teen boys that is, that um, we're in our second round now of that. And so, and this is all volunteer work that, that the men are doing. Um, and women as well. I'm on the leadership team of the movement. And so women have been since the beginning involved in the decision making in the direction of the movement. While it is um, a lot of the, in the streets late night on Fridays, it's men going out doing that stuff. But we have a lot of other things that men and women and children do together. Bike rides through the city. We must stop killing each other is the um, logo of the movement. So I just wanted to um, real quick play this clip if you would play. Just to give you a sense of just in this past year what's been going on with the movement. After another violent week in Baltimore City. This past July, there were 45 homicides in Baltimore. As the most deaths in the city have seen, we continue to track the explosion in crime since the city of Baltimore charged these six cops. A deadly and violent weekend in Baltimore. 29 people shot, resulting in nine. 14 year old victim as a third child killed in the city of Baltimore since the beginning of the year. And now, child advocates say something needs to change to stop the violence. Take everything that I'm learning and experiencing in my life 
and be involved in, um, you know, I talk to rape survivors about forgiveness because I was raped by a friend. I talk to homicide survivors about how to speak, tell their stories and get their needs met. I'm teaching, one of my favorite things that I'm getting to do, um, two things is we were able through community mediation to go into prisons and do the, uh, we do a 40 hour is our minimum in Maryland basic mediation training. We were able to go into prison twice to give that training. And someone from the first training became an AmeriCorps member at the Baltimore Center and now has a job at the Baltimore Center. Um, is intakes, right? Yeah, the director of uh, the intake. So, um, and then also we have a partnership with drug courts around the state of Maryland, where we've been doing conflict management training for people in drug recovery coming through the drug court system. And so, these all of these places where criminal justice, you know, is impacting people's lives, how it looks depending on where you grew up and how you look and what access to financial resources you have to maneuver that, there's not just one way to impact that system. And so um, I feel really blessed that my life brings me to all of these different ways to touch um, justice within these different systems. So. Mm -hmm. So why don't, um, for both of you, um, let's open up the floor for um, any questions that people have for Lori or Erica, or comments, etc. Did you mention something's happening with reentry in Massachusetts? I did. Yes. <laughs> Is someone Roz or Pete, do you want to take that question? Was I not supposed to say anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with the help of the Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration, we are doing a training in the next two days, with working mostly with the existing mediation centers in the state to train, uh, to get a program started in working with the sheriffs who are running the Houses of Correction. Uh, it'll be a pilot program initially. Uh, we can only train 20 people, uh, 19 people to begin with, but we're going to try and get started. And I started off because I went to my sheriff and I said, are you interested in this? And he said, it's a hot topic with all the sheriffs throughout the state. And I'd like to see it come to our county. So um, that's what's happening. And we're hopeful that we can, uh, thanks to what they, all they've done, we have all the information of, of, about how it's worked, and uh, we have a copy of the memorandum that they did with the uh, state corrections people, and so there's a lot of work that's been done thanks to them, and hopefully we can make it happen here. Does thank that you. answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yes. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I'll bring up the question of diversity of mediators because what we find is that only retired people have seem to have the time to do it and, and uh, because mediations are typically done during the day uh, uh, even though we are available to do it weekends and holidays and everything else it seems as if the only people who have no. What's, what, what are we doing wrong? I, I was just asking Eric if she wanted to arm wrestle me for uh, <laughs> The nub will probably win. It's going to let you go. You know, <laughs> know, know, and some stuff in um, so, I, so I think there's a couple of things that uh, potentially are to, to think about. Um, so one of them is once you get started with certain people in your circles, it's that much harder to expand out of that. Because you find yeah. that if we're all older white retired folks that all the people that we know and happen to be chatting with at the cocktail party are also older white retired folks and so we happen to be chatting with them about what we do and they're like that's great and I want to get on that you know, I want to get involved in that too and so then we're like well look we got this training coming up and it's full and it's all older white retired folks right and I say this with a world of respect for older white retired folks willing to do service to their community um, and if that's the only people who we have doing this work, then it's not going to have the same kind of impact as if we're really making sure that we have everybody at the table. 
So I think that some of it has to do with how you started. And so even as I look across Maryland, there's 18 community mediation centers, and the ones that started really as these grassroots social change movements um, are much more diverse now and don't struggle quite as much on a daily basis to kind of bring in that diversity as the ones that started uh, with a more sort of agency-based sort of a mindset. But once you are started, you are who you are, and you are now who you are, and so then the question is like, where do you go from there? Um, and then I think that one of the really key things to think about is every outreach that you do to try to get people to use the service, you should be telling those same people that they can be mediators, right? Because if you look at where you're going to do outreach to, to say like, hey, you need to use the service. Are you going to prison saying, hey, you need to use the service. You're going to addiction recovery facilities, hey, you need to use the service. You're going to the tenant association, hey, you need to use the service. If in every one of those you also said, hey, you could be a mediator, right? And so we're going into prison and training people, and lo and behold, they come out. Now you better believe that Cornell Anderson, when he came out of prison, had a ton of other stuff to do. He had debt, he had child support, he had, but he was so inspired, right, having been trained in prison, that the, one of the first phone calls he makes is to the community mediation center, and he was calling to volunteer. He wasn't calling to get a job, right? I and mean, he was working out his jobs in other kind of contexts, but he was calling to volunteer, and then the AmeriCorps position opened up, and so he took an AmeriCorps position, which is $12,000 over the course of years, not a lot of money, um, so he was still working other jobs while he was doing that. And, um, and then eventually now, now he is in the you know, full-time position. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with how we imagine where we go for volunteers and where we go for clients. And if we stop thinking about it that way, the flip of that, of course, and this is the challenge for all of you who are mediators, conflict resolution professionals, whatever you might be, is we need to also be bringing our own conflicts to mediation, right? Like there's not a group of people who have their shit together fixing the conflicts for everybody else. Like all of us are potential users. I've used mediation 10 times in my 20 year career. And all of us are potential mediators. So it's not that these are the people we need to get into the service. They're the people to offer the service to and they're the people to recruit as mediators. And I think just that one sort of slight shift in how we're imagining what we're doing um, can make a huge difference in, in how we do our recruiting. So that's one. The second then is to look at them, what are the big, and, and, and then the second I think actually is, I think that we imagine in a lot of settings that uh, folks who don't make as much money don't volunteer as much. Um, and that is not necessarily true. There are certain kinds of volunteer work where it's easier if you have a sort of a flexible job, which tends to be higher income jobs, tends to be higher educated folks with flexible jobs who can, who can do that. Um, but if you look at different settings, if you look at people involved in particular in their churches, right, there's a right. lot of people with very low income who do an extraordinary amount of, t of work for their churches or other, uh, other uh, houses of worship that they don't get paid for, right? And so it's just not accurate to say that folks who don't have as much money don't volunteer as much. It's just, but then we look at like, so what is it about the church setting that fits, that works? And is it because it's a lot of it's on Sunday? Is it because there's a deep personal faith-based connection? Is it that what is that that works? And what do we learn from that, right? Um, and then we look at the way that we offer our services and what it is that we do and what barriers are there that we can work with, right? So if we have people who are saying, yes, this is what I want to do. I'm inspired by the work you're doing. This is what I want to be part of. Um, and um, this, the reason I can't is because of childcare. Then we have to look at what kind of resources can we bring to the table. And so there's been periods in both the Community Asian Baltimore's history where we were able to get a donor who would pay for people's childcare if they wanted to volunteer mediate. And so we had single moms, low income moms who couldn't afford, who could afford to mediate but couldn't afford to pay for the babysitter to mediate. Um, and it was on the honor basis. They just told me that, this is when I was the director, they told me that that was what their challenge was. Um, and I said, how much do you need? And we had this donor where there was, it was an individual donor and so there was a lot of flexibility in how we spent the money. We didn't have to you know, track receipts and stuff the way that we would with a, a, you know, a state fund or something. Um, same with like bus tokens and taxi cab fare and you know, those things. Uh, arranging, when we have team, me team mediators, we arrange for carpooling for them. So someone's gonna go pick them up and bring them to the training, pick them up and bring them to mediation. So I think there's, there's, like if we then actively look at what barriers are left after we do our recruiting right, then if we look at what barriers are left, um, then I think that, that uh, um, we, we can then start to address those barriers specifically.
Um, and I, I was going to talk also about after the uprising and the first one, but I believe you can um, Yeah, just I want to, um, it dawned on me that I was lying. Another thing that I love is the police dialogues that we've done since the uprising. I want to say, too, to this point about um, volunteers, is that um, it might seem like a simple thing or an obvious thing, but it's not always as obvious that if you're doing outreach in a way where you're thinking, what are all the places that people hear about conflict and are we doing outreach there? Right? And so it's everywhere from the library to the supermarket to the mall to the, you know, to churches to banks to like, where to bars, like where do people nail salons, nail salons barber shops, right hair salons. Where do people hear about conflict happening where they could say, oh, I know about this place that could help you with it, mm -hmm. right? So there's that, and then there's also that if you are looking at what, well, who is in our community and are we doing outreach to them and you get them involved, then you are able to do more outreach in those communities, right? So it is going to be hard for the old white retired men to go into certain neighborhoods and have any credibility to say, hey, you can be a mediator too and come use this service. You know what I mean? Right. And so, <laughs> you do know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And so, <laughs> Um, so be thinking of all of that, like as an incentive, that we got to have credibility in the places. We need the people who are that community doing the outreach in different communities. Um, and then real quick, the police shoot dialogue stuff that we, so because, well, we were trying to, I was thinking about the, do that too, but I was thinking about the, um, the training you just did. Okay, so, okay, a lot of whole bunch. There's a lot of stuff that I love about what I've been able to do in this work. Um, so, there's the Baltimore Uprising, right? Everybody's heard about it, mostly on CNN. A lot of what you saw was wrong, but that's another training, so I'll leave that alone. But, it of course made everybody start saying, I want to be the change I want to see. What can I do what and we were doing that like we do a lot of work all the time and we were still like searching our hearts like oh my goodness what is our role what more can we give what else can we do and so we harnessed that energy that people had and we um, provided an extra basic mediation training in Baltimore so which basically meant I just looked at my calendar and said when do I have 50 hours of free time and it was October right so the uprising was in April it was in October but it meant that the Baltimore Mediation Center got a chance to start doing recruitment and so literally the training we just did um, were people who, because of the uprising, were saying, I want to be involved in social justice and healing my city. And so they are now going through a basic mediation. They, they just finished a basic mediation training um, because of that. Um, also, can, another, can I say something about that? Yes, for yes, um, so what we did, so this was a, this is also kind of coming back to this point about like um, how we do is as important as what we do. So we literally, like those emails and texts were like all heartbroken watching, you know, Baltimore, you know, burning and people struggling and people heartbroken and people feeling hopeless. Um, and we're like, what, what is the specific response that we ought to have as an organization? And I mean, individuals were out there sweeping the streets, marching, doing whatever, but like, what should our response be? And we, we weren't sure. And so we said, oh, like maybe we should start by doing what we know how to do, which is to listen, right? Oh yeah, we did that. So two days after, right? It was a Wednesday, it was Monday night. So two days afterwards, and so we just people started putting it on Facebook and we're calling into radio shows and we just had an open house and we put a fly a, a sign outside like our commitment was um, we're gonna listen non-judgmentally. We're like, okay, one thing that we know is not happening right now in this city, like lots of people screaming and yelling. Um, lots of people were like, you know, getting up on their soapboxes, good and bad soapboxes, but people were up there, right. but people weren't listening to each other and so we said well that's what we're going to do and so we opened the, the doors and we put out the signs like non-judgmental listening free here today and every day but in particular that day we had food too um, and people came in and so people like had space to listen and to talk and to process and people were asked we had signs on the, like a uh, portrait paper on the wall people could write like here's the commitment I'm making uh, here's what I want to see different here's what I can give here's what I need um, so those were the kinds of conversations. And it was out of those conversations as well as lots of Facebook conversations that people said, okay, I'm ready to be a mediator. Yeah. Um, and we said, like, you know, they had just finished the training or the training was full or whatever it was. And then we, just, we decided to add the, 
additional, we usually do group one training a year, added the additional one to sort of harness yeah. the commitment. And out of the, there were probably like 70 people who said they wanted to do it, and we got 20 really good folks, right? right. And right. by the time October came around, we're still serious about, yeah. uh, about being part of it. So. And during that training, there was a mom who was still breastfeeding her baby and couldn't get child care one day. And she texted me early that morning, can I bring my baby my child care? Just, I was like, girl, yes, bring the baby. <laughs> and so we had a baby all day at mediation training. It was awesome. The baby got more attention than me, but you know. <laughs> um, and then also out of what, those conversations, right? So Lori had been, of course, for years trying to say, hey, Police and community members probably should sit down and talk when they have conflict, right? When somebody doesn't like something that the police did and they make a complaint, which probably sits on somebody's desk for a while, then like there should be some way to have that conversation and get some kind of some kind of justice, right? Some kind of healing. And so, of course, you know, we've been trying to make these co different kinds of connections. And then suddenly there's an uprising and everybody remembers, wait, y'all talk, don't y'all, y'all help people talk, right? And so now everybody's returning on phone calls from two years ago. And so, <laughs> and, so uh, and so it was this, while it was heartbreaking and tragic, a lot of the things that were happening, the amount of hope and the amount of things that got built that are still happening to this day in Baltimore, not just the stuff that we're doing, but other stuff that organiz other organizations um, are doing, is just amazing. And so one of the things we were able to do um, is Lord like said, oh, while well, there's this opportunity, hey, let's build this, um, let's have an opportunity to have dialogue between youth and police, right? Because a lot of the, the big thing was always youth that's out burning things and it's police that, you know, that they're mad at in general, and so what is our role then? Again, we said, oh, we know how to bring people together who really hate each other to have conversations. And so um, with Brandon Scott, who was uh, one of the men you saw in the 300, he's the council member, ca councilman in, um, in the district where the Community Mediation Center is in Baltimore. And um, he is, he loves the kids, basically, and so all of the kids in his district know who he is because he's constantly engaged with them. He also, as a councilman, had some say-so over policing schedules and what he can make them do and say, yep, you're going to show up here at this day and time. But also, we were able to say, okay, how to have this conversation. So we created a model um, where we know you shouldn't just throw people together in this conversation, right? So there's one hour of having a conversation with police separate youth, one hour talking to the youth as well, private separate conversations where we're saying to both of them, what are your concerns and fears going into a dialogue with this other group of people? What do you hope comes out of it, right? Um, what were the times that you felt judged in general and specifically by this group of people, right? So we were able to do that, which helped us to form our agenda for when we brought them together. Um, and then we met with them together a few times as well. Um, and so it's just, the, the, it was amazing to see the things that happened. So youth who came in to the private conversation saying, I hate police, they, you know, they don't care about me, I don't trust them. Come and say anything. I'm not gonna say Only anything because I don't trust them. I'm gonna sit there and see what they have to say, <laughs> right? To by the end of the dialogues going, oh my goodness, every police is not the same. They are people too. <laughs> and, and I can take them one at a time, you know? And so when we brought them together, we were purposely having conversations not about what have you seen happen on CNN, what have you seen happen in the news, but specifically what have your personal experiences been with this other group so that that's what people were bringing to the table and they were building understanding as individual human beings, not bringing all of society stuff about the other group with them. And so it made them be able to, you know, we did some hard conversation stuff like when have you felt judged by the, uh, this other group, talk about it, but also things like what are goals that you're setting in your life and what are things you're doing to reach those goals? And they were paired up with one another one-on-one -on -one to have that conversation. And the impact that it had on officers was <coughs> just as amazing as the impact that it was having on the youth. And in our evaluation forms, all sides loved it. And the only things that they would want us to work on is that they think it should be longer and that they want food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other piece, just while we're talking about police and then we'll grab the other uh, hands. So the other piece that is coming out of it that I had been working on long before the uprising and then suddenly got phone calls returned, as Erica said, 
is the police complaint mediation program. So uh, starting in January, and then after you finally get the return phone calls, it takes a while to write policy. But starting in January, certain um, uh, that was my happy day. So I was trying to get my attention. Certain, um, <laughs> certain co complaints like unprofessionalism and harsh language and uh, discourteous, uh, discourteous. I can't remember the name of the complaint. Uh, people have the option to mediate, so they'll still have the option to go through the, the traditional complaint process, but they'll have the option to mediate, and so residents and officers will sit down and build an understanding about the incident um, and figure out together what they think the next step ought to be. Oh, yeah, I started talking about a piece of that, yeah. and I went to the dialogue. Yes, please. A uh, huge thank you, enormous. To be following in the footsteps of what you have done is a great gift to this state, so thank you. I run a community mediation center here in Cambridge, and I was interested in kind of the logistics of the reentry project about the intake and who does it. Inside prison, staff, we have a small staff, and I can imagine that's a big piece of how, this, how you identify, you know, the intake process. Yeah. So I'll give you the quick version, because that's a six-hour training. Um, you guys don't have anywhere to go tonight, do you? <laughs> um, like, so I, I, get, I, not, I can't get connected at this point? Or, it may just be on screensaver. Okay. Because I want to show you where you can find a lot more for anybody who's interested in... Uh, oh, I see what happened. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, is it going to work now? So for anyone who's interested in... Um, what I tried to do is really make okay. it very easy. For, for folks to, to copy what we have. And so if you go to our website um, and you see down your study program, best practices and sample forms, um, and this is like a 12-page document that goes through all of that. So you're welcome. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so, so this really talks about the details, what we do, why we do things the way we do things. So some of them are challenging to make them happen and why we do it that way. But the James. I'm Michael Miller, a professor emeritus from the University of California, it's Berkeley. A guy. It's the YouTube channel. It's program. And I also founded... Do you want that to happen now? <laughs> <laughs> In case I didn't get the memo, that was supposed to happen. Um, is everyone else here? That <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so, the, um, so we go in the, inside the prison, generally 12 to 24 months before folks get released. Uh, and we do a presentation and sometimes a series of I interactive exercises with folks to think about who would you want to have this conversation with. And then if people pick somebody they want to have a conversation with, then we do one-on-one -on -one conversations with them to screen, to make sure it's appropriate, to check for fear of retaliation, to get all the details to sort of open the case the way you might in any case. And that's got to be in person, right? Because you can't do that phone because it's not confidential in prison. Then we take it out and we contact the family member and that intake happens over the phone, generally. Um, and then if that works out, then there's all the clearance issues that have to be worked through. Again, that's all in there. And then people come together with two mediators in the prison before release. So the way that we've done it, again, for the first like five or six years, uh, we, we used, you might be familiar with this model, some of you are studying, it's, it's called the duct tape and shoelace model of sustainability. Um, it's, so, <laughs> <laughs> the, way that we, the way that we, uh, folks in the community mediation yeah, we get it. Model. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like, kind of patching together with volunteers, with paid staff that were paid to, you know, out of the general operating budget to sort of be going and doing that. We got AmeriCorps members involved pretty early on. We run an AmeriCorps program, and that really helped kind of increase it. So that's where Pop, uh, Eric's brother Pop was an AmeriCorps member, and he went in and, um, and did, uh, did a lot of those intakes. Um, and, uh, now we have, eventually, once we had the recidivism data, we were able, we've been able to get a lot, not a lot of money, we've been able to get more money. Um, and so we have paid staff, Erica's mother is paid staff. Um, in Baltimore City, we have another paid staff in Hagerstown, where a lot of the prisons are. And they, that's what they do full time. And they have two AmeriCorps members each that they supervise and help with that. Um, so is that answered? Thank kind of you. What you're yeah. thinking about? Good yeah. start. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in how restorative justice So if you could talk about it, uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, one one uh, piece in particular, I'm curious that in Wellington, when you speak of prisoners, 
do they ever want to speak with um, their victims, <coughs> their victims, uh, victims in order to be able to make peace with them or uh, set, maybe not make peace, but set a, a, a framework for being able to discuss with the community some restorative justice that a person isn't dealt with. So I'll, let me take a crack at, the, at that just because okay. there's a couple pieces in there. I think, um, I think one of the tricky things about restorative justice, uh, like with the term community mediation, is that it means very different things. And so we mean, uh, use it to refer to a lot of different um, concepts. So one, so a lot of people consider do consider the work that we do restorative justice because you're restoring relationships as Part of you're looking at the ways that relationships and community are affected by a situation, and you're working on restoring those relationships. And those Another thing that people sometimes mean by restorative justice is a victim-centered model, where it is specifically the victim or, or the a homicide survivor, and they think the victim was was a, a murder victim, um, is is specifically the one who is engaging with the person who caused that harm, right? And there's a question about how to restore that victim or the community. Um, and so, uh, so I don't actually, I get very worked up about what people are calling community mediation or not, like that's kind of my specialty area to get worked <laughs> up about. Um, I, for people, so some people call what we do restorative justice and some people don't, and I'm not, I'm not too concerned, but I just kind of highlight that because if you are looking at restoring communities and restoring relationships more broadly, then the work we're doing in the context of addiction recovery, where there, in a lot of these times, like so, so, when you look at it as like who was affected by the situation, in the context of addiction, someone might not be your direct victim, but everyone in your family was affected by your addiction, and your addiction may be tied to the relationships with everybody in your family that led to your addiction, right? And so it's, so there's sort of who was affected, it goes all the way around. And you and may have robbed some of your family members for your addiction. They could be the direct <laughs> victim, right? And so when we talk about that, there, there is some of that sort of restoring. But if you're asking about a specific model of a sort of victim-offender dialogue as restorative justice, um, that is not what re-entry mediation is. So while the, the person well, who, I was curious if people, uh, the prisoners ask to be able to speak with the victims or the victims. The frame of the conversation is who do you need to talk to to make your transition work? And so people pick who they think they need to talk to. So generally those people are not, at least they're not stranger victims, right? So they may be, again, if they stole from their you know, mother the last time they were living with her, um, you know, she may be part of that conversation. But generally it's not, uh, they're not selecting a victim to talk about the crime and, and, uh, and that piece of it. And, and if they were, but that's not the, uh, generally if you're doing that model, it's a victim-initiated conversation, and so we wouldn't right. start it from the inside and, and reach out, outside. But, okay, so question. I want to add but, to, but I'm interested oh. in terms of how restorative justice is incorporated. Well, that's why I was trying to give the big picture answer first, because that's the, like, it depends on what we mean by restorative justice. So what I want to say about it is, I think this is restorative justice. And so um, I think that if we are think, so for instance, even, I think because someone is in jail, we automatically assume that they are not a victim. It is very hard to find an offender who is not first a victim of a lot of stuff. And so very often, people are asking to have conversations with people who are on the outside, and those people on the outside come in, and the incarcerated person looks at them and says, why did you do X, Y, and Z to me that abused me and victimized me? And so this, Lord says this all the time, and I love this, that the word victim is a very fluid term. It's not real, like, black and white about who a victim ever is in situations. And so um, we are constantly restoring. So it's, uh, it's obvious to see how it's restorative justice when you're bringing you together and police together. It's obvious see this restorative justice when we're bringing together people who have been making complaints about police officers in their neighborhood who they think have been misusing their authority and bringing them together to talk with police officers, right? Because you can clearly see who you think the victim and offender is there. But one reason that um, Lord and I were talking earlier about this police complaint mediation program is getting a lot of support from the Fraternal Order of Police in Baltimore is because we're not starting with an idea that the police are the offenders in the conversation. 
right, that there is opportunity for everybody to talk about where they believe they have been a victim of somebody else's behavior or an injustice has happened in their direction. And so um, if we all, for me, if I only look at restorative justice as there was cleanly a victim of something and cleanly an offender of something, it means that I am not understanding um, the way conflict works a lot of times and relationships work a lot of times, but especially in a larger social justice um, perspective, we are constantly giving justice that restores people's hearts, relationships, homes, abilities to speak for themselves, abilities to rebuild new relationships with those people and with new people. Like we're restoring a lot of things when we are allowing all of these different ways for people to come together and have conversations, but specifically because we're not starting by saying who's the victim and who's the offender. So, <coughs> that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. So, a follow-up to that, I can imagine, talking about the community, <coughs> that some inmates may be concerned about going out, might be encountering their former victims, for people who are complex victims. So how do you talk about the the inmates fear for his or her own safety outside because of the past? Well, more often, actually, there was one that happened recently where this guy was, uh, yeah, so often it'll be like the gang here. The more often it's the gang someone's trying to get out of, right? So getting out of the gang, like getting out of an abusive relationship is like the most dangerous you know, time in that, um, in that context. So, uh, so that's often the fear that I hear people talk about more so than like the victim or the victim's brother or sister or something. You know, like, oh, well, that could be it too, but it's often the kind of sort of game. Um, and the short answer is uh, I don't talk about it, right? They talk about it. And so what I do is I listen deeply and I ask open-ended questions and I listen more deeply and I ask more open-ended questions and then I help them together brainstorm what do they think they could do about it, right? So they know more certainly about leaving a gang or not leaving a gang or their decisions than I ever could. But even when, you know, Pop goes in, who has had his personal experiences, you know, involved with love life and getting in and getting out and getting shot and shooting people and, like, even he's not going in trying to talk about it, right? He's going in trying to work on understanding um, and listen deeply. And that's the basic strategy with everything, you know, whether or not, and, and so people do. And so they talk about feeling terrified and they talk about, and then we reflect, right? Okay, so it sounds like you feel terrified. Um, sounds like you feel really trapped. Sounds like you're panicked about the idea of what's going to happen when you walk out there. Sounds like you're really proud of the changes you've made in your life, and you're really committed to staying on that that new track, um, and unsure of how you're going to make that work once you get out. Um, talk about what that might look like. What is it that you're afraid of? What, what would actually happen when you walk out the door, right? And then like you get you get to those deeper places. So you're using the same basic skills, right, and working on understanding. I do know that um, I did hear from a mediator recently about one of these mediations where he, he had gotten out, I'm trying to remember, he had, the last time he had gotten out, he got out and within 24 hours he went from, somebody was like, hey, good to see you, like gave him a drink, gave him a blunt, gave him something else, got him a woman, and like within 24 hours he was back in jail. And so he was sitting there talking about like, and he had lined up like on his way out the second time now. Whatever it was he did, I don't know what it was that he did, if it was a violation of probation piece or some new crime or whatever. So now he's getting back out again two years later. And he was like, if, and there was the whole gang question, and he was like, he had this job at two, your mom was telling me this, I'm trying to remember where it was, like, you know, not Roy Rogers, but yeah, Popeyes, it was a Popeyes. Popeyes. <laughs> so he's got a job at Popeyes, um, and he's literally saying, like, I don't care if I get shot and killed in my Popeye's uniform, because I am going to make the right choice this time. I am not going to go back to that life. I'm not, like, I am, and it, it is. And so, and so then the question was, okay, so, like, what, what do you need to make the right choice, right? His choice. What do you need to make the right choice? And he was doing Popeye's during the day and enrolled in something in the evening and just like his plan was to like fill his day so much that he couldn't possibly like go back in to be tempted to go back in and stuff and she saw him like a month later and he was still alive so it's a good start like we don't know right? I mean you don't know we did, like, we did have a mediation case we mediated with them several times in prison and a couple times on the outside and then we found out he got killed the guy got killed and that was really heartbreaking and that's the reality of I mean and that's why these issues are so complicated and um, but a Popeye's guy is 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that one's drawn last yeah. time we checked. So. <coughs> Isn't that a big part of the problem that when they get you is you know, all they know is the community they lived in. And so they want to go back and then all of the maybe the, yeah. the relations are there. Absolutely. And it's hard to say, oh, no, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is why <coughs> just that that's all they know, that's all they can afford. So it's real easy to say, well, I'll go back and live in the same place where you were using drugs and selling drugs, getting in trouble. Well, where else can I go? You know, when you get out of jail, it's not like they go, okay, so here's $2,000 to get you started. And here, here's, we redid your resume for you. And we, you know, and here's some places, some clothes to wear to go on these interviews and some transportation money. Like, that's not what happens when you get out. And so they go where they can afford, where they can afford to go. But, and so in mediation, they are able to talk about what is the reality of where I'm going. And so if where I have to go back to live is on the same block where I used to use drugs, what do I need to stay clean? If it's where I used to sell drugs, if it is where I used to prostitute my body, if it is where people are going to try to get me to do those things again, what would conversations with those people look like so I can stand my ground? What do I need to be able to have those conversations and make new choices? So it's, it's, we, nobody thinks it's like this pie in the sky. Oh, you listen to people and then suddenly, you know, everything falls into place. It's really, there's a very long, so when you hear these people on the take that there were charts and chart paper and like they they are doing a lot of work to get, what are the details of coming home and what it really looks like. What would you need in order to be successful? What are all those pieces? And realistically, given the circumstance you know you're walking back into, realistically, what are you able to do and what support do you need? And so, because people are able to get very clear about that, they're more prepared when they get out and somebody goes, hey man, let me tell you for a drink. And somebody else goes, hey man, have some weed. And somebody else goes, hey man, here's a woman. Like, they're able, they were, they're more prepared with what is my response and what do I need to realistically not do those things and we don't know other things. So, yeah. But the other thing I think to remember is I think if you're not in, uh, if you're not in the hood, you think that it's only bad in the hood, right? Right. And so, like, there's, you know, good people there, too. <laughs> and so while it is true right. that there are people who are making some problematic decisions and getting released back to people who are making problematic decisions right all around you makes it very tempting to go back to those problematic decisions, like your mom and your Aunt Rosie and you're like all those other people live on that block. Who live on that block. And so what we're doing with reentry mediation is saying, wherever you're going, like, well, I'm not going to judge where you're going. I'm not going to, I don't even know if it's a choice or not, but I'm going to say, who do you need there, right? And so what's happening is people are tapping into the indigenous resources that are in those communities. As, as devastating, as this is sort of, if you think about asset-based approach as opposed to deficit-based approach, like, who are the people you need, right? And what's your relationship with them like? And then I get to go, well, there is my sister, and she's there, and I mostly don't have a relationship with her, so I was going to go back to my husband who was prostituting me last time, but maybe if I could fix my relationship with her, she's five blocks away, but that's a safer place, and maybe that's where I go. And so, um, so even though I'm going back to West Baltimore, I'm going to my sister's house instead of to my husband's house, and that's going to be a different, because I've resolved this conflict, that's going to be a different kind of a thing. So, Yeah, the question was about program, did you want to read it? Oh, you can do it. The question about program evaluation and how long it lasts. So there's a couple different pieces to, you're talking about for the reentry mediation specifically. There's a few different pieces to the, um, and you can in fact read the 50 page version, 60 page version up here, so I'm going to scroll down. Um, there's a couple pieces to it. One is uh, we do pre and post questionnaires and then three months after people get out, we call them and we do a questionnaire. So that gives us sort of the social indices, what people are saying about their experiences. So that's three months and then we don't follow them by phone after that. It's very hard to track people. You know, phones get changed and cut off and everything else. Uh, there it is, recidivism results. But in terms of um, in terms of the actually looking at Department of Public Safety records to see if it's locked, locked up again, we keep look, every time we do. So we did analysis in 2013, then in 2014, and both of those 
started from people who were in the service in 2008, right, forward. So we actually keep looking at the same people over and over again. The, the kind of regression analysis that's used, both uh, logistical regression analysis as well as um, the Cox hazard analysis and the survival uh, equations, consider time as a factor in there. So you're looking at how much, as time goes on, um, controlling for how much time has gone on, people obviously are more likely to recidivate the longer they're out. Um, but all of that is controlled for. So a lot of these folks that we're looking at have been out for six, seven years, um, and they're included in there with a the decreased recidivism. Is that? Yeah, we can question. Is that? Uh, sorry, I, someone hadn't asked yet, and then we'll come up here. Um, a lot of what you guys do, it's very exciting to me, sounds like therapy, specifically relational therapies, um, thinking of family therapy approaches. I wonder if more, maybe, other social service agencies in the area doing similar type, types of work, if there's been any pushback, specifically because funding resources are so limited, that maybe they feel like you're getting onto their turf? Uh, there is no one else trying to get, you know, to go through the effort of like getting that outside person, dealing with DPSCS, bring them in, have that conversation. So the short answer is no. Okay. Nobody's trying to get in on this game. <laughs> I think about it, you know, around children, like the wraparound process, yeah. it sounds similar, just yeah. a different application, different context. And, and what I would say is, uh, so the longer answer is that um, there is, uh, so it is, where it's different is that, uh, it's my, I'm not a therapist, my understanding having been in therapy, had people in therapy, you know, like really valuing therapy, yeah. uh, that there's more of an analysis role that a therapist plays. And so the, the distinction that I really highlight is that a mediator is working on understanding, working on deepening that understanding, supporting people to have a conversation, but not bringing in any analysis, any sort of professional assessment of what's happening. And so that assessing and analysis is sort of the, can be helpful, is a therapeutic realm. <coughs> supporting deep understanding in a difficult conversation is a mediator realm. So that's kind of the, the uh, easy distinction, I think. There was one prison in Maryland that was a, it's a local detention center, it's a pre-release center in Montgomery County, that actually was doing good work with family members before we started doing this all over the state. And they did, they went and did home visits before people got out, they met with family members, we had sponsors, they brought family and, and residents together. And so when we first started working with them, there was this question, it wasn't so much competition from other nonprofits, but it was, they were saying like, oh, I think we do that already, I don't think we need that. But then as the conversation continued, they were like, well, maybe there's some people that could be helpful with. And then as we kept working with them, they started seeing actually very clearly how this was different from what they were doing, and actually the two supported each other. And so we ended up getting a lot of referrals from that particular facility. We thought, okay, well, we'll go and we'll just kind of get what we get, and there's all these other places we're getting a lot from. Um, we ended up getting a lot because there was such a value placed on these relationships in that facility. Um, and there was a more clarity about what their social workers were doing, which was different from what the mediators were doing, and that both together could be really powerful. So. Mm -hmm. I was going to just say from those two reports, the 2013 and 2015, that we got the, um, uh, was it? The That's the 2014, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to add a little bit to this thing about it being like therapy. While it can be therapeutic to have a space to vent safely and then feel understood, um, that one good, two things to do is you're building partnerships and you get like pushback from different experts and professionals who say, oh, we basically already do that, is to help while you're helping them see the difference so that they can say, oh, we can partner and I can be make, we can be making referrals back and forth. Also, places where you can't get in, like it's, it's mostly been when we've been, especially been when we've been able to train people and like even just a conflict management training, right? Four hours, six hours, eight hours, um, to like teach the skills that we're using and they go, Oh yeah, no, I did not learn this in college. No, this is not the way I listen to people. No, this is not the way I ask questions. The only thing that they find kind of the same is, I think I'm hearing what you're saying is, is that right? Like that's it, the, you know, the, but the, 
the way that we're listening is very non-judgmental, checking our opinions, moving our assessments to the side kind of way is something that while th when therapists take our training, they go, oh, maybe I can add this kind of listening to my practice. But there's a very clear understanding. Once people see what we're actually doing, on paper it sounds like a lot of stuff. That people are like, oh, I do that already. They just need like three hours in the training and they're like, yeah, this is not what I'm doing. God speed to y'all for doing it, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's really not the same. Well, I would say like you're talking about more traditional kind of therapies like postmodern family therapies, relational therapies, it's very value free. It mm -hmm. is, it sounds somewhat similar. I, I don't know your work well enough to say. Mm -hmm. I studied family therapy for a while, but mm -hmm. I was more about your ends of things and I think, yeah. I think it would be very complimentary. If anything, I think what you do would be less threatening because I think people hear therapy and they think there's something wrong. Absolutely. You know, so I think it's a lot more empowering yeah. to feel like you're, you know, sitting at a table with an equal in a mediation setting. So yeah. I think it's exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure you want to go into this, but I've been very impressed with the AmeriCorps workers and the fact that they bring great experience and youth. <laughs> to the centers, and I'm just wondering, we don't have that in, in Massachusetts, and how do we do that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we were having a conversation with Susan, uh, the M MOPC. At MOPC, we were just talking about like the MOPC, I don't know, should I say it out loud, as I like to put you guys on the spot? At MOPC, if they could be a sponsor for an American program that could place members in the, um, in the center. So, uh, we started that conversation today, and actually, I offered to share our application because you'll be competing in Massachusetts, not against us, and so you can take whatever we got. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, really, if, if any of it's helpful, you can copy and paste. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it is a very sort of—it's more of a technical answer, like how do you do it? No, um, but I, I think it's if you have a, you need a sponsoring agency, and you need everyone who's going to get a member to agree to certain standards and what they're going to do. Um, but beyond that, I like there are. It is one of the best decisions we ever made. As, and as much as it, it's a, it's it's federal money and it comes through the state and it's bureaucratic and there's a bunch of pain in the ass stuff and there's stuff we don't agree with. And despite all that, like I wouldn't, I'd do it a hundred times over to have the impact we've had. The impact both on communities that have been served by America members and then the transformations among the America members themselves. Who, by the way, I mean just everything I said about recruiting mediators is also the same for recruiting America members. Um, we do actively go to uh, places that are trying to place ex-offenders with jobs to recruit for AmeriCorps members alone uh, in those settings. And you do train them in a mediation? Before yeah, they have the 50-hour training, so it's 50 hours in Maryland, so it's 50-hour training, and then they get intake training, and they get a, a evaluation training. Mean, it's, like it's like two months, almost a month and a half of training before they, they get placed in the yeah. And I'll just piggyback on this, since Susan isn't here and Roz had to step out, so... Yeah. We'll MOPC, we'll we'll, we'll right, we'll just everything. volunteer everything we'll just for them. <laughs> but I'm really hoping that having Lori and Eric is the, Eric is the start of a conversation. And we started that at lunch of finding ways to, you know, benefit from that experience and uh, to try and do that here. So it, those of you who are representing community mediation centers, please do stay in touch both with us in the department, uh, because you know MOPC is in our department and we kind of have value added as well. Um, we'd like to facilitate some of those conversations. Uh, so stay in touch with Susan and stay in touch with us and we'll see if we can find ways to support that process here. At least convene spaces for you guys to figure it out how <laughs> you'll okay. make it work. <laughs> <laughs> right, we, we got the hummus ready, ready for these forums. Other feedback, questions, discussion? Okay, well, I think we may um, take advantage of that natural pause and um, let's um, think again. Yeah. I hope this isn't just a talk and everyone goes home and forgets about it. This is the start of a conversation, and um, the fact that Lauren's sticking around still for another day or two to help transfer some of these lessons to the Massachusetts community, I think, is really wonderful. If you're not a UMass Boston student or part of our community already, we'd love to stay in touch with you. So uh, come. 
uh, yeah, come put your contact information here, and we'd love to keep you in the loop about what's happening. Um, take some of our materials so that you get a better feel of what we're doing. Um, those of you who are conflict resolution students, if you haven't already, feel free to come sign in so that you uh, we know you are here. And um, again, I I like to highlight the, uh, our appreciation for the John Templeton Foundation and the Institute for Humane Studies for helping to um, provide the funding to do this. So please uh, do fill out the uh, the form and give that to Kelly before you leave, so that we can do our. Thank you again for coming. Uh, feel free to stick around and, and have informal conversations as well. Wasn't it great?